Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Patrick. I'm an alcoholic. And, uh... Wow, I opened right to the page that I set to. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I'm just really happy to be here and be talking here. But I mean, in multiple ways. Um, I didn't have to make it this far. You know, I, I was uh, due to those kind of surprise that I made it to my 21st birthday, and there was no chance I was going to make it to 30, and I turned 37 last month. And so I um, uh, was not expecting that. And, um, you know, to be here, there's a very odd sequence of events that has to take place for me to be in Northwest Fonts because I got sober in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I met some people there, and they moved to Vancouver, Washington. I moved to Vancouver, Washington a year later, and they said, hey, come to Fonts. I think you'll like it. And um, I wasn't wrong, but they were right, and it's been really um, fun so far. So, um yeah, briefly, you know, I um, I first in, really encountered Alcoholics Anonymous by reading the big book, and there were three parts that just had a tremendous impact on me right away. Uh, one was this doctor describing what he called the phenomenon of craving, and that just made perfect sense to me right away. It described how I lived for about 13 years, and um, then they went on to describe these mental blank spots and this mental obsession that I just changed my mind and I start drinking again. And um, then later at the back of the book, he said that uh, these people said that alcoholics get to a place where they can't imagine life with alcohol or without it. And they're the jumping off place and wish for the end. And so in those three things, the big book described how I drank, how I thought, and how I felt in just absolute perfect detail. And I had no clue what the stuff in between meant, and I started coming to AA meetings. And I found people who experienced the same things, and they didn't drink anymore. And uh, their thinking was still kind of bizarre at times, but it wasn't what it used to be. And, and they were happy, and I could see in their eyes they were happy, and I remembered what happy was. And they had my attention. Um, and so... I first did a 10th step about three and a half years sober. Um, I know this because my sponsor asked me, how's your 10th step? And I said, well, you know, it's going all right, I guess. Like, I, Sometimes I go home at night and I look at my day and I write some stuff down and I'm finding some stuff and I think it's going okay. And it's, well, that's nice. That's step 11, but that's nice. <laughs> And that was pretty juicy for me because I was very confused about the distinction between step 10 and 11. And I said, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, for the last few years, I haven't really understood this. They don't, they have these clear cut instructions, but when they get to step 10, it all breaks down. And I pull out my big book to show him. And it's worth pointing out that when I ask my sponsor questions about the 12 steps the 12 traditions, general service, the 12 concepts, he doesn't rattle something off from memory. He pauses and he takes a breath and he reaches for a book and he flips to the page that it's on. And then he shares it. And so my plan to go up against him is to read the Black Words Only pages to him to prove that I'm right and it's not clear. And so I read, this thought brings us to step 10, which is as we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we clean up the past. We've entered the world of spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. And at that point, I realized I'm reading some clear-cut instructions <laughs> that I have not seen. I've, I've read, 
multiple times in my book study. I've read with a sponsor. I've read to sponsees, and I never saw it. <laughs> so I try to prove them wrong, so God uses what's available. And I started to do this. So sometime after a couple days, somebody did something, and I call them up, and I say, all right. You know, they pissed me off, and he goes, have you done the first thing? I go, yeah, they pissed me off from calling you. And he goes, no. And I just, it's quiet, and I hear some pages flipping, and he goes, <laughs> when these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. Have you done the first thing? I'm done. Well, obviously not. You know, I don't tell him that. I'm like, so now I'm like, do I hang up and do the first thing? And call him back? Do I close my eyes and do it and call it, you know, and tell him? And I just, like, yeah, I've done the first thing. He says, okay. We discuss him with someone immediately and we talk for a few seconds. And he's like, Make amends quickly. You've harmed anyone. Have you harmed anyone? I say, yeah, no, I don't think so. I'm just a little disturbed. He goes, and we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Love and tolerance of others is our code. I say, okay, and I go off and do whatever it is that's next. And so over the course of the next several weeks, I continued to get disturbed, and I continued to get resentful, selfish, dishonest, and afraid. And when that would happen, I go... I know where these instructions are. I don't know what it says, but I know where they are. And I'd flip to the book and I'd read it and I'd go, okay, ask God that wants to remove them. And I do that. And I search them. And not every time, right? But, you know, more than I had ever had. And um, and so I sometimes I call them and it's like, have you done the first thing? And, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But like I'm getting more practice with it and it, it's happening more actively. And then, and, uh, so, you know, I'll just relay a few 10-step experiences I've had. I've, I figure I probably made a couple hundred 10th and 11-step calls at this po- in my life today. Um, so it's not like I don't know what it is, but it's not like it's been a cornerstone of my spiritual life for years and years and years. Um, you know, one one that really stands out to me was I had just finished doing a fist step and I came home and I got quiet for an hour and I start thinking, are there any more names? And I just had 30 names come right off the top of my head. And I'm freaked out because I had a long inventory. I thought I had everybody on there and I'm like, what is going on? This isn't my first time doing this inventory. This is my third time doing a fist step. And I'm just, and I'm, I'm just freaked out. And as I'm going through this and I call him up and he's like, you know, you might be making too big of a deal of this. And I was like, I don't know. Like, it seems like there's a lot of names here. And, and I'm sitting down, I'm like pacing back and forth in my kitchen. And I just, and I think of this dude that this new guy that I met recently. And I had told him a story earlier that day. And it's like, you know, I told him when I was first getting sober, I met my sponsor and my sponsor met me. And after a few weeks, I'm like, you know, it's not the guy that's the wrong guy. Like, there's this other guy that's a better sponsor. So I call him up. And I say, hey, man, you know, I picked the wrong sponsor. Like, can you sponsor me? And what I didn't know was that those two guys had the same sponsor. And they followed the same instructions out of the same book. And this guy knew my sponsor. And he didn't really trust my perspective on how I should be sponsored. And he said, sounds like you don't want to do the work. (laughs) And we talked for a little while, and to this day, I'm so grateful that he had that response, that he wasn't like, oh, cool, I can get another sponsee. You know, he's like, no, man, you're you're on the path, don't get off the path. So I, but I didn't tell the story quite like that. You know, I told him, yeah, sounds like you don't want to do the work. Click. And I left off that 20-minute conversation that came after. And I called this guy up, you know, the newcomer was like, dude I was dishonest with you I don't know I tell the story I said sounds like you don't want to do the work click I added the click for dramatic effect that's not how it happened we had a 20 minute conversation I'm sorry I was dishonest is there anything I can do 
We talked for about an hour and a half about his obstacles to participating in this fellowship and in this program. We got off the phone, and I walked over to my list, and I looked at these names, and I go, God, there's nothing new here. All these names is the same stuff as every other name on there. It's, it took me that to see, yeah, this is, I'm the problem, right? It took, <laughs> it took 400 names, an hour of quiet time, another 40 minutes of freaking out, an hour and a half long conversation to have some clarity to be like, yeah, I'm the problem here. And um, so I've made many other 10 step calls here, and I don't believe I have the time for it, but I will. You know, there's one that I do like, which is one that helped me understand that I believe at times that this is about me or it's just about me. Um, and it's always peculiar to me to learn what I have in common with other people at things like this because, um, like Allison from the ninth that panel, you know, I look at my amends as trivial and big and everything in between. And like Allison from the ninth step panel, I also have produce related dishonesty in my sobriety story. <laughs> Which is this lady in my home group who I adore. She has a wonderful smile and a wonderful laugh, and she's helpful to alcoholics and she's involved in service. And when I'm out of town, I say, hey, can you give our district, our meeting report, the district meeting, can you cover for me at the, at the business meeting? And she says, yeah. And um, one day last summer, she brought in a bag of tomatoes to the meeting. She said, who wants some tomatoes? Was beautiful little tomatoes, fresh from her garden. And I started thinking about it. I was like, okay, they're the exact same size as little mozzarella balls they sell at the grocery store. And like... I can trim up some basil and some olive oil. It'll be this lovely little summer caprese salad. And she gives me a bag of tomatoes, and I throw them in the back of the fridge, and I forget about them. And then they go bad. And then the next week, I see her at the meeting. She goes, hey, Pat, what would you think of the tomatoes? They were great. They were so good. I made such a delicious salad. And, you know, I have the meeting. And over the next couple of days, I'm going, What? I lied about and I I was like I can't see I I can't face her I can't look her in the eye and it's and I'm thinking this is stupid this is stupid and um, one day I call her up I say Cindy I lied about the tomatoes I didn't eat them I forgot about them threw them away sorry she goes thanks for telling me you know I'm just not going to give you any tomatoes anymore (laughs) That's fair. <laughs> and at the next meeting, I see her. She says, you know, I just wanted you to know I really appreciate you telling me the truth about that because, you know, I care about you and I want us to be honest with each other. But also, my son was in the car and my son has been having real difficulty staying sober for years and years and years. And he told me how impressed he was with you that you called me to tell me the truth. So I think that this stuff is about I'm not okay. And on a good day, I think it's about I'm not okay with you and I want a better relationship with you. And on a really good day, I get some glimpse that, yeah, it makes me feel better and maybe it makes us feel better, but I don't know the consequences of my own actions. That was true when I was drinking. It's frequently true when I'm sober. I want to look at these promises it says, we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For this time, sanity will sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil as if from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we'll find that this has happened automatically. We'll see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. It is the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding it. Avoiding temptation. That's what I came here for. You know, I wanted to not drink. I couldn't not drink. I needed to learn how to not drink. And they say, hey, you do this stuff, you're not going to drink. And I have some stories of reacting sanely and normally. The craziest one to me is 
having lunch with my mom and some friends at a place that makes these really great margaritas. And I order Arnold Palmer, and they all order margaritas, and the server comes over, and she spills a tray of margaritas on my face. (laughs) I did not think it was funny. (laughs) Not out of the social awkwardness, but I'm sitting there, and I'm begging. I'm like, if this gets in my mouth, I might die. (laughs) And I'm just reaching out, I grab napkins and I dry off, and fortunately I'm, you know, my home group is just up the road, I'm going to be there in an hour, I'm like, I'm gone, I'm out there, I'm just going to sit down, you know. So I need a solution that, like, clearly avoiding alcohol is not an effective strategy for me, because sometimes... So I moved into a, a new house, and this, my neighbor, I see him coming down the, down the sidewalk, and he's just super friendly, and his beer out in his hand, and I go, no thanks. No thanks! Holy smokes! You know how many times I tried to not drink before? And all the, you know, I was just saying, no thanks, no big deal. And then, about six weeks ago, I'm at a family reunion, and oh, it was so wonderful, because the previous time I saw my family... It was at my grandpa's funeral, and I looked my cousin in the eye, and I said, in one hour, you're going to see the ugly side of alcohol. And at this family reunion, I was sober. I got to cook for them. Really great picture. It was a wonderful meal that I prepared for my family. I was very happy about that. And um, my cousin's getting into scotch. He was about 10 years younger than me. Man, this dude loves scotch. We had been loving scotch since about lunchtime and he's telling (laughs) my family and friends about the different characteristics of scotch from different parts of scotland i went to scotland i talked to a scottish police officer i've had lots of scotch i want to interject and it's like that's not how i contribute to life anymore that doesn't matter my opinion on scotch is meaningless today and he goes, hey, have some. Now, I've, I asked my dad to put in the Christmas newsletter, Pat's a sober member, sober active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I have made this information available to my family at some point. But, you know, it's my dad's Christmas letter. I don't think my cousin's reading it in that great of detail. And he goes, Pat, have some, have some of this. I go, no, thanks, man. And he goes, no, really, it's good. And I was like, no, I'm really good. I don't need it. And he says, dude, it's good. I go, I'm not going to drink that. And it was firm. But for me, putting a bottle of alcohol to my lips might as well be a shotgun. And so I think that being firm and having that immediate response is pretty sane and normal at this point in my life. Um. I didn't know that Alcoholics Anonymous was available to me. I know that we know so many people who don't know this thing is here. And that's just the, I don't have to drink anymore thing. But this, I had no idea. Like, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, you see newcomer comes in and everybody's like, oh, this is going to be cool. Like, if he does this thing, it's going to be a cool story. And you're like, what's all these, what are, what's up with these people? You know, and it's like, and then we do this stuff and we go, yeah. You know, this is what becomes available to us. I had no idea coming in, so thank you very much. Thanks so much, Patrick, for that. Patrick. Hi, my name is Patrick, and I'm a member of Al Anon and a member of an Al Anon family. Um, kind of strange. Two Patricks on this panel and a Patrick on the front of the panel. I've never seen so many Patricks in my life. <laughs> the Irish are well represented in recovery. <laughs> um, I got into recovery in um, 1998. Um, and 
I had read about the 12 steps back in 1991. But I read that third step, and the first thought that came screaming in my mind was, you can't go there. And I didn't reflect on it much, because I felt, you know, ultimately, my self-will was winning the game. Uh, and what is self-will for me? It's my godlike intellect with my godlike willpower with my human fear backed by, you know, guided by my human fear. And uh, I got, I'd uh, suffer quite a bit in the next uh, seven years in various ways um, trying to figure out what my problem was, what's my problem, what's my problem. Because I did not grow up in a family with active drinking. Uh, there were active drinkers and siblings and extended family and I can remember at Thanksgiving one wing of the family came over and the boys there were, there were four there were four boys in that family three boys in that family and uh, two ended up in AA or three boys in there were three four boys three boys ended up in AA and one just got sober during the outpatient treatment and I can remember that when they came over for Thanksgiving, there was such, I was very young, a hunger to open up that beer. They, they really wanted to get to that beer. And I just thought, wow, that beer is great. I wonder what it will be like when I get to drink it. But uh, I just don't have a physical allergy for it. I had a physical allergy for something else that was working for me at the time. And that was food. Food was my master. It was my solution to all my problems. And uh, my dad died at age 66, grossly obese. Um, he didn't have he didn't have an allergy for alcohol, but he had the allergy for food. And it sounds kind of strange, but uh, and that's what eventually got me into uh, recovery through in 1998. I, went to OA and first figure out whether it was a cult or not. <laughs> and uh, then to uh, understand that uh, I lost the power of choice over food. Just as much as your alcoholic stories, you know, my solution to life was to binge. That was my solution. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Is that better? Well, I don't know if I can raise this or not. How about that? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you want to hear me. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and Working recovery has been the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, without exception. Uh, as I said, uh, um, I'm not a. Um, if you look at all the degrees on my wall, I'm obviously not an idiot. Uh, but I also had a hell of a lot of willpower. When I was a kid, an example was I thought, you know, I read about the Indians running down deer. They just run after them until the deer collapsed. I think I'd like to do that. Just go out and run for several days. Get it, you know, run a deer down. What an accomplishment, you know. Um, I, I just had willpower. I just had it in spades. Uh, it, it, between that and the food is probably why I didn't commit suicide. Because my attitude on life was, Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. I'm going to get it. One way or another, I'm going to get it. And uh, I had a boss tell me I was at work and I did this project. It was worth a lot of money to the company. And he told me I was wrong. And I was a tax attorney. And uh, it took eight years to prove him wrong. And boy, I did it. Successfully litigated it. Eight years. Focused. 
So, um, I was not an easy sponsor, sponsee. <laughs> um, if I didn't understand it, I wasn't going to do it. If you can't explain it to me, I'm not going to do it. you got to tell me why. Well, what is this all about? Because I learned early on that in the spiritual world, there's a lot of bullshitters. And I was going to find out if you were a bullshitter. And um, so uh, it was very challenging. Um, but what happened was I really couldn't understand this book when I came in. I, you know, for all my, because I came in with old ideas and preconceived notions, and I came in out of six years of counseling. And so this was group therapy again. One more time for group therapy. And uh, I worked the steps, you know, my arrogance was, I came in, I looked at the steps on the wall, 12 steps, 12 months, I'm done. Why are you people still here? I don't get it. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to get this done. My willpower. This is, I'm going to pop this thing, get it done, fix my problem, and I'll be off. I'll get out of my obesity, which I've not been able to do before. And, you know, my brilliant mind was at the time before I came to OA, it was Weight Watchers OA, Weight Watchers OA. Well, I think I'll go to OA because it'll be cheaper. And um, what eventually OA got me into al because I had a sponsor that every time I was around my family, I began to binge. And he asked me if there was any drinking that went on in my family. I said, well, yeah. And he said, I think you better go to Al-Anon. Let's go to Al-Anon. And um, the next big thing was uh, I ended up out in Denver. And uh, I got hooked up with an Al-Anon sponsor who was hooked into this program. And... Uh, hooked into the Fellowship of the Spirit. And I went to my first Fellowship of the Spirit in uh, Colorado. It was in Granby in 2007. And I got sold. I heard the real deal in my group. I heard the real deal. There was one speaker. I was a woman. She was one of the featured speaker, uh, one of the featured speakers. I can still remember, she said, I, I'm from the city of beautiful homes in Illinois. And she talked about establishing a relationship with her alcoholic father who had murdered her alcoholic mother to the point that not long before he died, she came to peace with him. They had a reasonable conversation. And she participated in his funeral. And I said, that is power. Because at that time, my feeling about one of my primary caretakers was, I will spit on them before I close the casket. That was power. And I said, this is what I want. I want this power that's here. And I proceeded to work those steps to the best of my ability. And it was hard. I um, Two years into the program, I fell into depression. I started going to Bill Wilson route. And I was around a bunch of people. I just didn't have any answers. Uh, my depression got so bad that it looked like I wouldn't be able to write the rent check and they were going to throw me out and evict me. I just couldn't move. Uh, and that was after doing the 12 steps to the best of my ability. And I read about Bill Wilson and his chronic depressions. And I said, Jesus, I told my sponsor, well, this is, if this is recovery, this is a warm bucket of spit for a thirsty man. What the hell? And Bill got a lot of criticism for his depression. But I was having to change fundamental things deep within me that I wasn't even aware of. And they were being thumped pretty damn hard. Because I was an achieve, succeed, win kind of guy. That was where my willpower was. Focus, achieve, succeed, win. Get it done, no matter what. Get a job, stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning, go home, take a shower, go back to work. That's who I wanted to be. So I, I brought that 
chief succeed in doing this, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. I gotta, I'm got i going to proceed at God's pace. That's it. Um, two hardest things I've done in my life were... Uh, God's taken me some really odd places, you know, places I never thought I'd go. Um, I spent nine months backpacking around India and Nepal. Uh, I did the hardest thing in my life over there besides work this program, which is spend 10 days in silence meditating. Just scared the hell out of me, but it, after that, I never had depression again. It broke it for me. Because being able to meditate like that, I could start seeing what my deepest concerns and fears, the broke extreme level of self-dishonesty, because I was ignoring anything I felt for a chief succeeding me. But Ten days in silence, and even feeling depression in there, and observing it and not being depressed, but just observing my feelings, that they're just sensations. And they're there to tell me something. They're there just to tell me what my belief is. What am I thinking? Because it's rock solid in me. What I believe affects how I think. How I think affects how I feel. And how I feel affects how I act. And that is what comes up with me whenever I'm doing a 10th step. That, uh, that's what comes up for me Whenever I have someone call me on the 10th step, I immediately go, what you're feeling is about what you're thinking. What you're thinking is, um, is about what you're believing. And I want to know what you're believing in me. Tell me, what are you believing in me to? And that's what I got out of a fourth step. I take them back. I will take them back, and we will go right through the fourth step. From beginning to end, we will just read it. And go through the columns. Because I want to know what you're believing in. And I want to know when I'm doing something, what am I believing? What am I believing when I'm in, in that kind of stuff? And um, what happens for me is, you know, as Patrick read, um, we continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. You know, What's the solution to fear? There's only one solution the big book says is trust in God. Do I have a God I can trust in in this situation? Am I willing to trust in God in this situation? That's my solution. That's it. That's all the big book says. Um, selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. What am I believing in? Do I, you know, is the world purposeful, meaningful, and benevolent, or there's some sort of malevolent world here I have to deal with? And for me at this point right now, I sit and I'm constantly saying, God, what would you have me do? Am I, is this okay, God? Should I do this? I have this constant conversation now with God all throughout the day. God, what would you have me do? What would you have me say? And that's what the big book offers me, is a continuous, constant relationship with God, as well as others, as well as others. And having a tenth step here, and why do I need a tenth step? And it's just so, I love this language. We, Alan Honors, are undisciplined, so we let God discipline us in this simple way. We have just outlined. That's, I'm undisciplined. What does it mean to be undisciplined? It means to lack control, lack self-control. And I let God discipline me by having a continuous, constant conversation with God all throughout the day. Didn't know what I was going to share before I got up here. Ask God for some ideas. What do you think I should talk about? Patrick talked about everything. <laughs> but uh, that's my experience, strength, and hope with step 10. Thank you for listening. Eric Oden, Sheriff, please. Hi, everybody. Erica Maynard, alcoholic. Hello. Hello. So 
the tenth step, um, continue to take personal inventory. Good. Um, <laughs> um, I was told uh, by a past trustee, she was 46 years sober when she told me this. I was in Richmond at Fem Thoughts on the East Coast somewhere around 2014, and she said, You only get one crack at promptly. And uh, so stick that one in your back pocket. Um, so, um, you know, I was taught, and I try to remember that step 10 is really, you know, continue to practice the principles that we learned in 1 through 9, really. I mean, step 10 for me is like 1 through 9 and like one movement, right? It's got all the attributes of steps 1 through 9 in this one step. And, um, um, I'm developing this relationship with the observer, with the capital O or the watcher, with the capital W, this this um, power that I don't understand, but I, I'm starting to feel this relationship and I'm starting to rely on this power where I'm moving into... Um, you know, we've entered the world of the spirit. I always ask people, mm, have you really? Um, it's like a good question because uh, some days I feel like I have and some days I feel like I'm back to being driven. And um, so it's movement from develop from trusting in information or in form and moving into trusting in spirit, inspiration. And, um, you know, our speaker this morning spoke about it beautifully. Um, and, you know, I don't know that we ever really understand it, but we just continue to try to stay on this path of moving in this direction. And, um, and, uh, and so as we're vig vigorously commencing this way of living, as we cleaned up the past, one of the most important things um, for me for step 10 was to finish my amends. And I remember my sponsor, Linda, she passed away in 2007, but she said to me, um, so I was sitting on like, I don't know, half a dozen amends. I was so busy. I mean, I didn't even know busy. I had one kid. Like, I didn't even know busy. I have four kids now. Like, I didn't even know busy. And I'm thinking, I'm so busy. You know, I sponsor so many women. I think I sponsored four women. I thought, that's so many women. And I thought I was so busy, and she said to me some things, and she said, um, I was at her house in Indianapolis, and she said, um, Erica, there's a world of difference between having a handful of amends and being complete with all the amends that you're consciously aware of, right? And, you know, I just have this little, I'm just a little bit of, um, I just always have a little bit of pushback and that the sponsorship has been my most surrendered relationship. Um, but I still feel this little, mm, when she said that I was like this little tiny, like, mm, like how different could it be really? And, uh, but I'm listening, right? I'm like, okay, okay. I, I trust her more than I trust that little voice. Right. So that's just this little small voice, even though the bigger part of me is like trying to hear what she's trying to say to me. And then before I left, she really hit me with it. I have a six hour drive home and she said, well, you know, if you're not willing to go back and make those amends, obviously you think you're immune to alcohol. And I don't know. I think I was about, well, I know also where I was. It was, it was in uh, late 2003, early 2004. So I got sober in 96, so however long that is. And, um, and th my first response, of course, is that pushback, like, um, like, you don't even know, you know, like, I'm not immune to alcohol, like, I, uh, like, with all I know, you know, I'm, I'm like, I do AA, you know, and that lasted for like, like, literally just like this intense feeling for like, bam, and then it was replaced with, I, I think she's right, 
and it scared me. And um, because I didn't really know what she was talking about. And so I had this six hour drive home to just contemplate and pray and try to take in the truth of what she was saying to me that my actions are saying that I believe that I'm immune to alcohol. And um, because if I didn't believe that I was immune to alcohol, if I thought I was powerless, if I really believed that I was powerless, then I would do what I did in the beginning, which is anything that's possible so I don't have to be her anymore. And so I got about the business of of completing my amends and um, of those that I was consciously aware of. And that set in motion this huge waves of change in my life that I could not have created and change in, in myself and it finishing those amends she was right there's a world of a difference between being she was so right I mean I was able to actually practice a 10 step for like the first time I couldn't really make myself watch right continue to watch for selfishness dishonesty resentment and fear the problem with me is extreme self-centeredness and this selfishness dishonesty, resentment, and fear, I'm always watching my actions, right? I'm like watching out here, like, how do I treat you? Well, that's a bad uh, test because I will die behind acting as if. Acting as if is not a spiritual program of action, right? I will literally die behind people pleasing and acting as if and putting on a smile and like, uh, I don't, I can't live my life based on that. Those problems do not exist outside of me. Those problems are all on the inside selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear, the big shows on the inside. And so that's why I'm watching. That's why I'm watching for that shift. And and I've developed this relationship with this watcher, this observer on board. And so there becomes this kind of a space on the inside that I'm watching. And I'm developing this relationship so I can kind of watch this. As our speaker said before, I can observe the feelings, not become the feelings. I can watch, oh, I think I'm getting angry instead of like, I am the anger, you know. And, uh, and like all my life, I had been my emotions. And like, you just know me and you know that. That's how I was. And um, I mean, I think I made a little bit of progress there, but maybe not some days, but, um, but it's this, so continue to watch. And when these crop up, I mean, just like you said, I mean, it is very simple, but it's like, what? Uh, it, the practice of it, when I first started practicing a 10 step, I would call and just complain and tell the story about what they did. And just so you know, that's not a 10 step. Um, not even close. Um, there's no surrender in that. And it's just still, you know, them and, and a in three words or less, it's not them. And, uh, so, uh, watch, ask God to remove it. Um, I'm going to read my book. So I'll tell you the wrong thing. Um, ask God at once to remove them. Discuss them with someone immediately. Make amends quickly. That can be the most simplest thing. It can be simply saying to my kid in my kitchen, um, Chance, when he was a teenager, he's 28 now. He was two when I got sober. Um, and uh, Chance, uh, I really shouldn't have said that to you. Like, I can cause harm and it doesn't look like the crazy person that I was when he was two. The crazy woman that raised him, right? Um, but that energy can still be there that just cuts. And um, that's what I don't like about myself is when I hurt people. And and the problem is that if I love you the most, you get hurt the most, you know, and uh, it's really very sad. Um, And uh, so it can be very simple. You know, I watch, I notice that there's a disturbance in the force on the inside and I, I just pause. God, please remove this chance. I really shouldn't have said that like that. Here's how I should have said it. Um, And then my sponsor made me add when he became a teenager, your mom has some control issues. I I didn't like that, but um, I mean, it's true, but I didn't want to say it. And uh, uh, the first time I said it to him in the kitchen of our house, he said to me, "Um, that's okay, mom. I know. (laughs) Everybody. Um, and so, um, and then, uh, we turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Um, I just have to quit thinking about me, right? Turn my thoughts to someone I can help and love and tolerance of others is my code in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and there's nobody that gets a pass out of that. There's nobody that does something bad enough that they don't deserve my love and tolerance. 
And uh, that's just a rule for myself. Like that's love and tolerance is my code. And um, I mean, I get pressed on that because I have some justified resentments at times where people are wrong. And it, it's hard for me to move through that when people hurt people. It's hard for me. I feel very deeply. And uh, so that's hard for me. But I, I that's my kind of promise to myself. And um, one of the problems I think with step 10 is that uh, with that I've seen with women I've worked with and with other people is that we don't usually talk about it. Um, we don't usually call somebody. We can't always call somebody in the moment because it's inconvenience. We can't just leave our, oh, just a moment, boss. I got to go make a phone call. <laughs> and um, that doesn't work very well in, in real life sometimes. But I try to make a little note and I try to keep track with my, I have a sponsor. I have a steel on steel group of women that I, I'm, we have the same sponsor and we are in a circle together and we just, um, they're my people that I kind of bounce these things off with. I talk to my sponsees. I mean, I'll really talk to anybody. If you're a closed mouth understanding friend, you will know anything about me if you are in my path. Like if you're the person that God puts there, I really don't have much limits on what I'm willing to tell you. My sponsor thinks that's kind of somewhat of a liability. But what I found is that if you, if anybody uses that information to hurt me, it's not really hurting me because I'm safe and protected. And it's unfortunate for you right? If you're the one doing that, um, for the person that does that, um, because, um, it's, it's just not good Jojo for us, but I just want to, um, it's easy to let up on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels on our past things. It is easy. That was my first reading at my very first meeting was that, that paragraph. And I didn't know what they were talking about, but, um, but today it makes a lot of sense. Um, I was talking with a little gal yesterday and, um, she's like, well, I mean, I'm fine. And I'm like, well, I mean, you're fine as far as you know, <laughs> right? Um, we, we don't always know, right? Um, I don't see myself very well. Alcohol is a subtle foe, sly, devious, difficult to detect an enemy. And I don't often see it um, until it's too late. I'm the last to know that I'm in trouble. And that's just my experience. And I just want to say one thing about every day is a day. Well, we have a daily reprieve, right? I'm not cured. Um, I have a stay of a death sentence, like to just for today, I get to be recovered as long as I'm engaged in my recovery just for today. It's not a place where I arrive to. It is just for today. I get to be recovered as long as I maintain these principles in my life and I keep love first place. And, um, I must carry the vision of God's will into all of my activities. How can I best serve thee? Thy will, not mine, be done. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. I think there's a reason they use constantly. We can exercise our willpower along these lines all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. And I just want to talk about that really quick because I had an experience. Thank you. Um, when I was... Uh, when. Mike and I dated for four years, and then we lived together for three years, and then we got married, and we um, had twins, and then we bought a house, and then um, another baby, but so we have four kids. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. I mean, I don't know why it would happen to me. Um, so that stuff happens to other people, um, and uh, um, I'm still confused by it, as you can tell, but um, so when we lived together for three years, I remember I would be cooking dinner and he would come home from work. He'd done nothing wrong. And I would have this energy would come over me and it would just lock me up, man. And I would be mad at him. He'd literally done nothing wrong. Hadn't talked to him all day. And I would just be locked up in this energy. And I saw this pattern. It happened every once in a while, not like daily or anything. It just happened every once in a while. Um, and, uh, over the years, this kind of happened. And, um, at the beginning when it happened, I didn't know to pray. I just was kind of locked up in my energy and then I'm stirring the food and I'm making hate food. And, um, <laughs> and remember he hasn't done anything wrong. And, um, and that really affects by the way, how the, this is, this is just extra, this ain't AA, but, um, as you cook, as you do anything, if you know, who you are when you're doing it, like it's imbued with that energy. And so if you're cooking food with love and beauty, like it blesses all who eat it. Like that's just how it is. And so be careful how you cook your food when you're feeding your family. Um, um, and so, um, so 
I, I, over the years, like it progressed and I started praying. I started practicing this 10 step. And then one day we're at our house and we got kids running around. He comes, I hear the jangle in the door. I mean, it's still powerful. It's not any weaker, that feeling of cut off in that shroud of darkness that's over me. And, and I hear the jangle jangle and I'm like, um, I say the prayers, you know, God, please remove this fear, direct my attention where you have me be instead of afraid. Um, please take away this resentment. Um, and I, I ask, what would a good wife do? Proper use of the will. What would a good wife do? Because I don't know what a good wife does. I have no idea how to be a good wife. I didn't come to this world knowing how to be a good anything for you because I'm just, ever since I can remember. I mean, usually two-year-olds grow out of it. I never grew out of it. Just this self-centeredness. And it, God said, go give him a hug and a kiss. And that day I walked over to, and I did not want, I did not feel like doing that. I'm locked up in this anger that I don't want to have, but I have, it's still on me. And so I walk over and I give him a hug and a kiss. And um, I, he probably doesn't remember it, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And it, it, that two minutes set the tone for the rest of our night. And I didn't have that happen again where I got locked up when the keys jangled. And I don't know why that w was, but it was like a miracle. And so that's what I feel as though is a, is a proper use of the will. And um, so that's all I got because I'm out of time. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.